In a normal game of Age of Empires, there are many phases where your focus is on different things. Most of the time, you're adapting to how the game is going. After your opening, you have to decide how much you want to invest in Feudal Age before clicking up to Castle Age. In Castle Age, if the game is in your favor, you might add Town Centers and defend for a strong economy to get even more ahead, or maybe you see an opening for a Siege Push to finish off the opponent. If you're behind, you have to gain an advantage somehow. This comes down to knowing what your opponent is doing and choosing a counter strategy. If he's going 3TC, you can try to get back in it by going for a Siege Push. If he's attacking you, you can try defending by stopping villager production and then going for a big counter attack. You might be wondering why I bring up these Castle Age strategies and how they relate to your opening. This is because your opening often doesn't end the game, but it does influence how the game develops. Usually you'll want to go for a timing attack where you have considerable mass of units or when a key upgrade completes. You can also go for an economic advantage where you greedily expand your economy or a positional advantage where you control an important hill to deny resource rich parts of the map. The follow up becomes very important in these cases. Having a large economy means nothing if you can't defend it. Likewise, controlling a hill doesn't matter if you're not pushing from there or the opponent attacks from a different location. This means that your active game plan should be working towards a specific goal where you gain an advantage. In order to achieve this goal, you have to stay focused on it. When going for a crossbowman attack in early castle age, don't lose archers in feudal age, and don't attack before upgrades are in. To do this, skipping horse collar for a faster castle age time is common. This is an example of where you're going for a tech advantage at the cost of economy and military size. When attacking with knights and siege in early castle age, you want more units and less technologies and economy. For this, you focus on adding siege units and knights, and maybe even monks before adding town centers or extra upgrades. For both of these aggressive examples, the follow-up is often economic. Once you have your crossbowmen with bodkin arrow, you're free to add town centers and work towards a huge economy while your crossbowmen keep the opponent occupied. In the case of forward siege, once your gold bank starts running dry, it's probably about time to add town centers and stop the push. Hopefully you've destroyed every building around your siege shop and can comfortably boom while being ahead. Alternatively, the opponent GG's from your push, but it sometimes just doesn't happen, so you don't want to get careless and lose in the long run because the opponent went for a super greedy eco expansion while you focused on taking down one town center. If you're going for an economic approach, you have to have a plan for what to do once your economy is running. Will you work towards Imperial Age, or go for a push later on in Castle Age? The timing that you're working towards here is after you can support constant villager production on all town centers, which is roughly 6 farmers per town center or 16 farmers with wheelbarrow for 3 TCs. Once you reach sustainability, you can move on to your next plan, which can be adding military for defense or offense, adding more farms to produce more army, or go up to Imperial Age, or even add more town centers to expand your economy further. Balancing your overall game plan based on your previous plan is important so that you don't get punished for being too greedy or not greedy enough. If you've just finished expanding your economy, it's probably better to go to imp or add military instead of expanding it further. Once you've assembled your army for a big push, it may be time to focus on the economy next. If you go for an early crossbone attack, you need to follow it up with more army or more economy. In addition to army technology and economy, there's another category you should consider as well. This is position. Having a positional advantage helps you to control when and where engagements happen, as well as secure or deny resources on the map. It also helps to reduce damage taken in less protected areas, such as in the case of an outpost revealing enemy crossbowmen before they kill any villagers in a forward woodline. In other words, position is used to enhance your main strategy by investing less resources to accomplish a better result. Supporting high army count but less technology allows you to keep back crossbowmen with archers, dodging shots on the map on a hill. This can buy precious time for you to get up to castle age for your own crossbowmen. Supporting a high economic investment would be walls and towers, or even a defensive castle. This allows you to not die to enemy aggression without investing into your own army. Finally, supporting a high investment into technology would be when you get a castle on a hill to push with trebuchets in early imp. Instead of having an army to protect the trebuchets, a castle is usually very effective for a fraction of the cost. Again, investing into a position allows you to use less resources for a better result. Okay, with that out of the way, let's look at how to follow up your opening strategy. First, we need to think about at what point our current goal is complete so that we know when we can move on to the next one. This can be after you assemble a certain number of troops, hit a timing with upgrades, after all town centers can be sustained, and more. 
The best thing we can do here is look at specific examples, so let's start with the one I'm most familiar with, Scouts Opening. With Scouts Opening, your goal is to make a few scouts in early feudal age to deny walls, gain map control, and possibly get some villager kills. Once you have your scouts out, you have to move on to the next step. This can be adding an archery range for archers or skirmishers, or going to castle age. Adding archers can help to get through walls, and skirmishers can prevent you from dying to enemy archers. Going up to castle age will leave you vulnerable to feudal aggression, so you have to make sure your walls are up. This investment into technology with only scouts to protect you is sometimes tricky if your opponent is going for heavy aggression. These are the strategic thoughts that you should have before or after the game. What we're going to talk about here is the point in which a goal is complete and you're ready to work towards your next goal in game. For scouts, get to 4 total including your starting scout. If going straight to castle age, add farms up to 15 and put 5 on gold at around 29 villagers. Your click up time should be around 33 villagers plus wheelbarrow. If we're instead adding an archery range after the scouts, we need to float food for upgrades. We want to get the archery range as early as possible while maintaining villager production and getting fletching and horse collar at a reasonable time. We also can't wait too long to place the range, otherwise we're better off with the straight to castle age idea. Getting the range at between 9 to 12 on food is the timing. This includes your berry villagers, so if you have 5 on berries, then the order in which you spend your wood should be 4 farms, archery range, mining camp if you're going archers, and then the blacksmith. Once you've got these things, you can add as many units as you need with upgrades while maintaining constant villager production. At this point, you can think of what's next. Will we go for crossbowmen and castle age, or go two stable knights? Will we go for a siege push, ballistics, or add town centers as a priority? Locking into this decision doesn't have to happen until we click up to castle age where we need to rebalance the economy based on the follow up. If we're going for a lot of crossbowmen or knights, we need 9 or 10 on gold with the gold mining upgrade. If going crossbowmen, we don't need as much food so we can send farmers whose farms have depleted to wood. If going knights, maybe we reseed those farms. On castle age, if we go town centers and knights right away, we can probably use gold miners to build at least one of the town centers as we can rely on our banked gold to keep knight production for a while. This will allow us to get up more farms to actually maintain those town centers. The important thing to keep in mind is to stay on track with your goal. If you're adding TCs, make sure you have 16 farms with wheelbarrow set aside for them. If you're going siege, fight the urge to spend your wood on town centers until your push is underway. You may have banked wood, but you're better off spending it on more siege or a monastery here. This is where checking out my Heroku app for what numbers of villagers you need on each resource to maintain constant unit production comes in handy. As you can tell, as the game goes on, you have to be less specific with your goals. In the early game, you can have exact villager numbers that you send to resources. In the mid game, it's more like get to 15 farms and click up around 33 vills plus wheel. Later on, it becomes the timing to hit the enemy is at the moment I have 3 trebuchets and cavalier upgrade. Having even a basic goal will give you a bit of structure to your game instead of just guessing at everything. If you find that you go on autopilot at a certain point in the game, it's because you stopped working towards a goal. The last thing that you actively thought about might have been getting to 3 town centers with 2 stable knight production, and when you snap out of autopilot you might find that you're floating over a thousand wood and have 6 knights queued in each stable. In this situation, you need to quickly come up with your next goal. Most likely, you should cancel all of the knights, click to imp, add 5 more stables, send 12 lumberjacks to stone and another 12 to gold, and pull back your army. Of course it really depends on how the game is going though. At this point you should be working towards your early imp goal. Having a castle on a central hill to produce trebuchets is a fairly high priority. As soon as imp completes you should be queuing trebs, cavalier upgrade, and plate barding armor. The rest of your resources should be put into knights. Once this is all done, the last step of your early imp plan is to attack as soon as cavalier finishes, hopefully before the opponent gets imperial age upgrades. This is just a sample early imp example, and won't be applicable every game, but it's pretty common for a civ like Frank's. And there we go, we now have a potential thought process to take us from building our first 4 scouts all the way up to imperial age. Coming up with goals that you can potentially work towards is something you can do outside of playing the game to improve strategy. Knowing which goals to work towards at any moment is in fact at the core of decision making. 
First, you have to know which decisions are viable. Then, out of those viable decisions, you have to decide which one makes the most sense for the current situation. Analyzing your losses allows you to filter out those bad decisions so you can make a better choice the next time you're in a similar situation. To finish the video, I'll leave you with some basic ideas that you can use as a starting point to follow up your opening with. If you get an early economic advantage by killing enemy villagers, you can increase your lead by walling up and adding town centers while matching army investment of the opponent. Even if you're trading units one for one, you'll get more and more ahead due to the snowball effect of the opponent losing a villager early. If you're the one who took economic damage, you can't sit back and be passive. You should try to make the game messy by going forward with towers or doing a 1TC push in Castle Age. The messier the game, the more chances you'll have to take to take an advantage by picking off villagers or getting a really good fight. Being the aggressor also allows you to get a good position on the map if your enemy is stuck defending. If you crush your opponent's attack and you still have a good chunk of military left over, now's your time to go forward and put pressure. Don't do the same as your opponent and throw your army, but use it to harass his walls and take position. Maybe a forward siege workshop or a castle on a central hill is a good idea. If you're the one who just threw his army, then you have to pay close attention to what your opponent does. If he goes forward, you may need to add a counter unit such as pikemen or mangonels to push him away. If he sits at home, you might be okay to assemble more of the unit you've already upgraded, as you have a bit more time. The problem is if your opponent goes imp and you aren't on the way up and don't have military. In this case, it's very situation dependent, but you want to delay your opponent's push for as long as possible. This can be by raiding or stonewalling parts of the map. Some games you throw beyond salvation, though. Okay, I hope this has been informative. You're not going to be a master of strategy just by watching YouTube videos though, so go queue up and gain some experience, and I'll see you there.